by poets that I have admired for years and whose poems are in this anthology. I would like to begin by reading a poem by Louise Bogan I, because she was, for me, quite seminal in terms of, 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 a, of a quiet power that I found in her poems. And I will read this poem called Medusa. I had come to the house in a cave of trees facing a sheer sky. Everything moved. A bell hung ready to strike. Sun and reflection wheeled by. When the bare eyes were before me and the hissing hair held up at a window, seen through a door, the stiff, bald eyes the serpent on the forehead formed in the air. This is a dead scene forever now. Nothing will ever stir. The end will never brighten it more than this, nor the rain blur. The water will always fall and will not fall, and the tipped bell make no sound. The grass will always be growing for hay, deep on the ground, and I shall stand here like a shadow under the great balanced sky, my eyes on the yellow dust that was lifting in the wind and does not drift away. was consultant in poetry to the Library of Congress in 1945, 1945 to 1946. And in 1976, 1978, Robert Hayden took up that post. Um, the, the musicality, the, the blues, and, and the, the subtle irony, and yet love of his poems sustained me through all of my younger years as a poet, and even today. So I'd like to read the poem, Homage to the Empress of the Blues, by Robert Hayden. Because there was a man somewhere in a candy-striped silk shirt, gracile and dangerous as a jaguar, and because a woman moaned for him in 60-watt gloom and mourned him faithless love, two-timing love, oh love, oh careless, aggravating love, she came out on the stage in yards of pearls, emerging like a favorite scenic view, flashed her golden smile and sang. Because gray laughs began somewhere to show from underneath torn hurdy-gurdy lithographs of doll-faced heaven, 
and because there were those who feared alarming fists of snow on the door and those who feared the riot squad of statistics. She came out on the stage in ostrich feathers, beaded satin, and shone that smile on us and sang. And I'll read a couple of uh, my poems that are in the anthology. This, this first one is, was read at the um, inauguration of the uh, William Jefferson Clinton Library in Arkansas. But it, goes, it pertains to, I think, uh, libraries everywhere. It's called This Life. My grandmother told me there'd be good days to counter the dark one with blue skies and the heart as far as the soul could see. She said you could measure a life in as many ways as there were to bake a pound cake, but you still needed real butter and eggs for a good one. Pound cake, that is. But I knew what she meant. She was always talking around corners like that. She knew words carried their treasures like a grape clusters around its own juice. She loved words. She thought a book was a monument to the glory of creation and a library, well, sometimes just trying to describe jubilation will get you a bit tongue, so let's leave it at that. But my grandmother was nobody's fool, and she'd tell anybody smart enough to listen. Don't let a little pain stop you. Try as hard as you can every minute you're given or else sit down and shut up. Though in her opinion, keeping quiet in noisy times was a sin against everything God and democracy intended us for. I know she'd like where I'm standing right now. She'd say a man who could measure his life in deeds was larger inside than the vessel that carried him. She'd say he was a cluster of grapes. My grandmother was only four feet ten. But when she entered a room, even the books came to attention. Giants come in all sizes. Sometimes a moment is a monument. Sometimes an institution breathes, like a library, like this halcyon day. <laughs> book, which is a, a book-length um, study of a biracial uh, violinist, prodigy, who in his 20s actually um, premiered Beethoven's Kreutzer Sonata. Beethoven wrote it for him, and um, he premiered it from one day to the next. His name was George Bridge Tower. It's called The Bridge Tower. If was at the beginning, if he had been older, if he hadn't been dark, brown eyes ablaze in that remarkable face, if he had not been so gifted, so young a genius with no time to grow up, if he hadn't grown up undistinguished to an obscure old age. If the piece had actually been, as Kreutzer exclaimed, unplayable, even after our man had played it and for years no one else was able to follow, so that the composer's fury would have raged for naught, and wagging tongues could keep alive the original dedication from the title page he shredded. Oh, if only Ludwig had been better looking, or cleaner, or a real aristocrat, fawn instead of the unexceptional fawn from some Dutch farmer. If his ears had not already begun to squeal and whistle, if he hadn't drunk his wine from lead cups, if he could have found true love, then the story would have held. In 1803, George Holmreen Bridge Tower, son of Friedrich Augustus, the African prince, and Maria Anna Sovinki of Biala in Poland, 
traveled from London to Vienna where he met the great master who would stop work on his third symphony to write a sonata for his new friend to premiere triumphantly on May 24th, whereupon the composer himself leapt up from the piano to embrace his lunatic mulatto. Who knows what would have followed? They might have palled around some, just a couple of wild and crazy guys strutting the town like rock stars, hitting the bars for a few beers, a few laughs, instead of falling out over a girl nobody remembers, nobody knows. Then this bright-skinned papa's boy could have sailed his 15-minute fame straight into the record books, where instead of Regina Carter or Aaron Dworkin or Boyd Tinsley sprinkled here and there, we would find rafts of black kids scratching out scales on their matchbox violins so that someday they might play the impossible. Beethoven Sonata Number 9 in A major, opus 47, also known as the Bridge Tower. Mm -hmm.